and welcome to Trek Central Weekly. I'm... Wait, am I Commander or am I Captain? I can't remember. I'm Commander Don Paris, and we are here to talk Star Trek Prodigy Episode 14, Crossroads, where our uh, puckish rogues um, are trying to find their way to the Federation and to Starfleet without the Protostar. And to join me for this live discussion, we have my wonderful co-hosts, uh, Favri and Starfleet Boy. How are you two? Trek Central oh, no, we don't. Oh, what happened? We don't. I'm here. I'm, Commander Dom <laughs> I'm doing good. I just beamed up uh, from a yeah. ice planet. I was chasing these uh, rogues on the planet uh, <laughs> who have stolen an experimental uh, uh, Starfleet ship. And so... Uh, yeah, I'm a little upset, so I'm here, but I'm here. I made it on time. Yes. <laughs> and Fabri, how are you? Uh, I am very well myself, and I'm actually not in a Starfleet uniform. It's just a little chilly here with some of the, the cold weather blowing in, and because I grew up in the 80s and 90s, I'm wearing a windbreaker. So uh, it looks very Starfleet uniform-ish, but uh, yeah. this, is, this is my uh, cool weather wardrobe. Very nice. And, um, and yeah, Dom it's very cold here, so I always have the beanie, <laughs> but it's cold. I wear the beanie in summer. It's painful, but uh, we we do what we must to keep up a bit. Um, but anyway, what did you two think of Crossroads? Uh, Favri, I'll start with you. What did you think of this very interesting episode for Prodigy? Very much a crossroad, as one might say, uh, for the series. Yeah, it was a, a big episode. There's not a ton of things that happen, but the things that, that do happen are big, and they're things that the show has been building towards. So that you know that first encounter, that first contact, I guess I should say, with Admiral Janeway, and it goes uh, horribly wrong. Also, the metamorphosis with Murph that they had been teasing for a while. Uh, we had known for a, a very long time that Okana was going to show mm -hmm. up in Prodigy, so we finally got that. So a lot of things just paid off. Uh, it, you know, it was a, a lot of action, a lot of adventure. I had a really good time with that. I think if people didn't enjoy this episode, it's probably because of frustrations with the, you know, the miscommunication and like, oh, why can't they just, you know, explain themselves? And uh, you kind of have to just you know, buy into the, I guess the contrivances that they, that they set up that, uh, yeah, you know, in order to have like this fun conflict that, you know, they do have to misinterpret things for a little bit, but it, for me, it was done in a way that I, I was able to buy into and I was having so much fun uh, with the, the, you know, the setting of the Noxie station and just getting to see the, uh, the Zindi show up, you know, some cool surprises like that. And, and so it, it overall just paid off for me. And, and I loved that uh, big cliffhanger ending. So it, it was, definitely uh making me ready to come back for the next episode and see what happens next yeah definitely and talking about the miscommunication starfleet boy what did how did you feel about the fact that basically all our characters got to interact with the dauntless bridge crew but none of them got to say oh yeah y you may hate me right now but there's a bigger threat uh how did you find that I, well, I felt just like rock talked it. <laughs> like you guys all spoke to Starfleet, and you didn't even mention this thing. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, the 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 show did a really clever job of like making it difficult for all of them to say it. Like poor Rock Talk kept trying to get someone's attention and couldn't get anyone's attention. Um, Jankum gets insulted by <laughs> the doctor, mm. Dr. Gnome. Um, and then uh, uh, poor uh, uh, Gwyn has kind of like a, like a tough moment uh, with um, Essentia. And then, you know, of course that moment with Dahl, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it uh, in detail, but that was like a delightful moment, but Dahl couldn't talk about it because Janeway was interrupted by her duty, you know? So it was like, I thought it was like really well done because it like built up this like mm -hmm. kind of feeling of like, are they going to get to say it? Are they going to get to say it? And of course we know they wouldn't this early, right? Like, mm. <laughs> I guess we're really yeah, late in the We've seen the some show, trailers of, <laughs> oh yeah, they're going to, like at New York Comic Con, we got a scene of, which was shown in this episode of the Dauntless firing on the uh, protostar we find out in this episode that it was because of murph just jumping on consoles uh, <laughs> apparently the protostar doesn't have the anti butt dialing technology that the enterprise had we, with we, riker we've seen in 
we saw an accidental <laughs> torpedo launch on uh, the Prometheus, though. Yes, and Murph did fire uh, a torpedo or phasers in the first or second episode. Yeah, right. it, it, he actually, found the pew 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 button when they escaped yes. Tars Lamore the first time. Yes, this episode beautifully uh, mirrored those moments too. I thought, which was really funny. It's like we got the new Murph, and Murph does kind of like the same thing and like accidentally sets off, you know, uh, like a weapon. And also when the protostar was rising out of the snow and Janeway standing there, it was framed very mm. similarly to uh, how it was with um, uh, what's his name, the robot um, uh, Dreadnought. Dreadnought, thank you. I, keep, I don't know why I keep forgetting poor Dreadnought. Um, <laughs> he's not poor. <laughs> but yeah, so I thought that was really cool too. Yeah, and I think, you know, you have a point there, but definitely how well-timed it was in the first couple of episodes when they did need to find the pew 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 button uh, to get out Tars Lamora, and how terribly timed and well-aimed it was in this episode to fire on admiral janeway's ship uh so we'll see what the repercussions of that are but i guess we should start more at the beginning of this episode than at the end of the episode um what was the name of the uh station again you said it previously the noxy depot there yeah what did you guys think of this place i saw you talking a bit about it on your own uh live stream uh but yeah what did you think yeah i would um place it's a it's a neat place. I would uh I would stop there to get gas if I was passing through. Mm-hmm. Stop <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Um, the, yeah, I would also stop to get gas. I like it. I like that. Uh... <laughs> oh, it's like, like it's like a there's... Bucky's. The not non Texans are gonna know what I'm talking is, about. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, any, anyone out there from is. Texas, it's kind of like a Bucky's, right? He's he's, you know, you if you if you're going from one city to another city in Texas and you pass a Bucky's, you have to stop. It's like the best gas station in the world. It's really hard to explain like how good it is, but you know, the cleanest bathrooms ever, uh, decent food, uh, just you, so many gas but pumps and have to wait to get gas. Like. It doesn't look like it has clean bathrooms. <laughs> like, I don't know. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Bucky's, Bucky's is far superior to the Noxie station, but I, w- I would still stop by there. It looks like there might've been some interesting things going on. Yeah, it definitely I looked like a <laughs> hub of um, scum and villainy, in a sense. Yeah. Or, uh, or what did they a call haven it for here? smugglers, as they, they reword it. Yeah. A haven for smugglers, um, but, but we I, know what they were thinking. I did really enjoy that we got the return of the Zindi reptilians as the security yeah. force for uh, this station. Obviously, you know, they were seen in Enterprise, never seen again, because... Enterprise was the last produced one, but the earliest chronological one. <laughs> so everyone's like, oh, they got where a name drop in they got mm-hmm. a name drop in Star Trek Beyond though. That's kind of cool. And they have some symbols showing up in uh Discovery. So we knew they were there. Oh yeah. Cool. Um we see some Zindi insectoids in Discovery. Yes. They, which they look don't quite look different. like insectoids. <laughs> uh which are very more humanoid, I guess. They could have been messing with genetics. Uh, but I saw a, a post on Twitter uh, of the outfits of the Zindi Reptilians and how originally they were just reuses of the Riemann outfits from Nemesis, which mm-hmm. I didn't know makes oh. a lot of sense. But oh. in this episode, they very much dress them up to not just be look like a reuse of Riemann outfits, that they are their own outfits. They still look like the Enterprise era, that fashion for the Zindi reptilians, or I guess the uniform hasn't changed, even though Starfleet has changed their uniform numerous times. Um, But it it was nice to see the Zindi there just doing their own thing and managing security of this small depot, which I I just thought was really nice to see at least this group of Zindi reptilians role in the galaxy now. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it's just, it's always good when these storytellers that are trying to do, you know, their own thing in Star Trek and make it their own, but you still can never go wrong if you just use the universe. You know, if there's something, if there's something that exists within the past of Star Trek that will suit your purposes, by all means, you know, just go ahead and use that. So, oh yeah, you need some, some tough kind of thuggish 
security dudes at this alien space station. So, you know, why not look through the uh, back catalog of Star Trek alien races and, you know, hey, here's one that no one's seen in a while. Let's throw some Zindi reptilians onto this planet. Yeah, definitely. Um, I see some questions in the chat about uh, live subs uh, for the live stream. I think there are some auto-generated ones. Uh, they might not be the best. They may um, get some things wrong. Uh, but we thank you for being here. I don't think... No, there are no subtitles available for this episode. Um, so if some people in chat could communicate that... Um, to anyone, I see, I think it's William Brown, who's deaf in the chat, uh, well, thank you for being here, uh, but I don't think there are subs for this live stream, so our apologies for that. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, let's carry on with Danaxi Station, we have Fadian O'Connor there, um, obviously, he, I heard that he was meant to be, like, a recurring character, a mud-like character in TNG, uh, did you, without all the, oh, William Campbell, kind of leaks that he was going to appear in Prodigy. Did you expect that O'Connor would appear in Prodigy, uh, Starfleet Boy? I No, I didn't expect it, but I'm really delighted by it. And uh, so far, so good. I really like the uh, update, you know, catching up with him, I guess, you know, and seeing where O'Connor is these days. I like the the way the that his ship, the erstwhile, was realized in the episode. It's got like a nice, you know, kind of... Just yeah. enough upgrade, you know, and stuff like that. that. I was I was not <laughs> expecting that. I, I totally forgot that, you know, his ship had a name. And, mm, and I did too. It, I totally forgot all it. that stuff. Is it yeah. an Antares class ship? Is that what the class of ship is? No, sure. I think it's its own animal. It's, oh, okay. not, it's not an Antares. Because it has that similar look to it of like the bit, of the like cab yeah, section and then engines. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah it, I guess it looks it's very like... industrial. Mm. It's like you know, it's like a working ship. It's not. It's not made to to look tough. It's not made to look sleek. It's made made to work. It's made to look like yeah. the Starship version of Millennium Falcon. Um... And uh, Okana, <laughs> my, also... my dog is agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah. Okana still looks handsome too, so uh, that's nice. Yes. He's, he's, he's still easy you know, I, on the I feel eyes. Sorry for him. <laughs> I, I, I feel very sorry for Okana. Why? Why? What's up? Well, I think he's had a, a rough couple of years. Oh, look yeah, at well, him he lost when he eye. was on. <laughs> well, not just that, but just even more recent than than losing his eye. You know, if if you look at how he appeared in twenty three eighty one when he was DJing at Starbase twenty five. Yeah, know, he, he, still, he doesn't he wasn't have a, gray. Yeah, he doesn't have like the gray hair, and, and then you look at him two just to uh, three years. Since three then. years later yeah and he's like completely gray like even like like the the tip of his ponytail is gray right so I, I, I don't know what he went through but... time. he could have totally had like a time travel adventure or you know <laughs> because of the dupla incident at the star base it was very stressful for him and that's when the graying started um and he was like i'm, I'm going guess... to go away from starfleet go away from federation i don't want to deal with duplas again uh uh, I'm going to go and do some stuff. <laughs> that being said, he you but, know, he's but compared to I, Indiana Jones a lot, and I feel like this is kind of the same as like how like Harrison Ford looks cooler as he gets older as mm. Indy, you know, like like more rough around the edges. Are, are you like... sure he gets compared to <laughs> Indiana Jones? I've never heard that. I've never. I mean, sorry, Han Solo. Han Solo. Okay. Han Solo. Okay. <laughs> but you know how like you know how that's Indy what I, gets. That's like... what I thought you meant. <laughs> yeah, I totally meant Han Solo. That's okay. That's <laughs> But just like, you know, I guess we finally saw old Han Solo, but what I'm, mm. I guess I just meant Harrison mm -hmm. Ford, similar to how Harrison Ford is aging very gracefully and, you know, ruggedly. Uh, <laughs> so is Okana, and it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I now will... that we're talking oh, yeah. about this, I, I remember that uh, Captain Pike, I guess, proves how quickly you can go go gray watch the first episode of discovery season two mm -hmm. and then watch the last episode of discovery season two and you'll see anson mount's hair go from uh being pretty dark to uh pretty white well at least it's interesting that we're talking about fadian o'connor going gray and not wharf uh which was a big uh discussion <laughs> when that trailer dropped uh, yeah, but i will I... say it is very nice to see the continuity between the animated shows 
hopefully we do get more of that between the live action and the animated and the live actions themselves but seeing O'Connor in Lower Decks with an eye patch, and hearing that, I think it was Mike McMahon say, oh in season I think that was season 2 uh, they changed mm-hmm. a character to look more like their appearance in another show a lot of us theorized, oh that's O'Connor, because O'Connor looks very different than what we previously saw him with an eye patch, and yeah, he's in Prodigy, so it's nice that these showrunners are talking to each other, yeah, and being like, oh, okay, you have O'Connor with an eye patch, we'll give him an eye patch here, and he'll have an eye patch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's super nice that that's happening, and it's also super nice that like this, the all the shows can have that like. That's kind of, I think, a delightful thing uh, for fans. By the way, uh, Aldrich in the audience, thank you, says it is an Antares class freighter. Okana ship. Oh, oh it is. Okay. Uh-huh. I guess I don't know what Antares is then. Sorry. Um, well, you know, there is that famous poem, right? Beyond Antares, the the one Gene Roddenberry wrote or something. And uh, Nichelle Nichols sings it, I think, if I'm not mis- mistaken. I, I think so, yeah. Uh, I didn't know that was written by Jean, but yeah, I think uh, Nichelle I Nichols think so. uh, spoke that. Um, obviously, we also have, I think, the Zosa, uh, which was Cassidy Yates's ship being in Antares. Um, and I, I think I watched a couple of Cassidy Yates episodes before this, so that's why I was like, oh, it's an Antares. Um, but I, I do Most have a they question. Have the, the same ship, but it's cool. I didn't really yeah. Know. Yes, what's um, your question? And the question is... What was O'Connor smuggling to the depot? Because obviously it was something bad and something not allowed, but they were like balls. Um, and they seemed yeah. like they had liquid in them because I, if I remember correctly, they kind of sloshed. Uh, so it could have been they like, like the uh... ale or something. <laughs> uh, well, that's I, I'm idea. pretty sure those are so... supposed to be the the Ferengi uh, the spheres that are used for different right. different Ferengi technologies. But also I gotta go back Ferengi and watch tech. because Dom's got a good point. Like, maybe that, that's just, like, what's housing the real contraband, which could be, like, <laughs> Romulan ale or something. Like, Yeah, or so it could be, like, there. some illegal some illegal software that's on those things. Oh, yeah, that's or... true, too. Yeah, but, but yeah, fathery... Uh, uh, and others have determined that it's uh, Ferengi uh, technology, and it's correct because if you look at the episode, the battle, uh, Damon Bach uh, uses one in that episode. Yeah, it looks the most like that. It has like that same type of um, kind of like Aztecian pattern on like the bottom of the sphere, and then the top it has like the the red semicircle thing. So, I think Dom's some, furiously something typing that was... something. <laughs> well, anyways, that's our answer to your question, Dom. I think that's what it is, too, Ferengi technology. Thank you. Um, I was just replying to uh, some of the questions in chat, specifically about oh, the um, closed caption system. Uh, it seems that we can do closed captions uh, in a setting before the stream starts. Uh, so we'll be looking at that before, uh, well, okay. after this stream, because it's grayed oh, out right, right now. Uh, so hopefully we can um, do that going forward to help uh, add some inclusivity to those hard of hearing or deaf viewers that we may have. Um, but we thank you for uh, checking us out. Um, also, and, uh, yeah. according to Memory Alpha, the erstwhile is not in. in oh, Tari's what is it? What is it? Oh, what is it? I don't know, but I just looked at their Antares <laughs> page on Memory Alpha, and they the don't have they don't there. have it listed. Uh, yeah, they don't okay. have they don't have Outrageous Okana listed for the TNG appearances. They only have uh, Legacy mm. and Unification One. Yeah, because well, you do see a like a debris of it, a hulk of it, in Unification. Um, but yeah, let's talk a little bit about the Dauntless crew. Uh, I have seen some uh, takes online that. Uh, like Commander Tysus was kind of evil for just walking past Rock Talk. Uh, we also have the uh, Doctor, the Tellarite Doctor, Doctor Nuam, uh being quite hostile to Jank and Pog. 
there is a discussion there about how much that is actually being hostile and how much is just Tellarite culture. Tellarite culture, yeah. Um, which is, you know, something to talk about. But learning a little bit about Jank and Pog and Pog being a term for runts in Tellarite society. Uh, I don't think we've ever seen a Tellarite with a surname before. Uh, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, because it's always been like Ambassador Graal. And, yeah, yeah. Well, th- unless they did it in Enterprise somewhere. I don't think that I don't think it's ever happened. They've no, always just had like one word yeah. names. Yeah, so it could right. be that that was our little hint to Jankum being a little different. Um, and it does kind of explain how short Jankum is because he's extremely short. Yeah, uh, I was Dr. happy Nome to says, hear it. That's always felt weird to me, that he's he's supposed to be 16, but he's, like, three and a half feet tall. Like, yeah. how is this dude so short? You know, he's, like, half of Kate Mulgrew. Like, uh, so I love that I love that we have a explanation, and it was a good one, and I, I buy into it. And just, Jankum Pog, like, needed, he needed to get kicked off his high horse a little bit. He was, you know, walking around thinking he was royalty, because Tellarites were a founding member species mm. and yeah he needed someone to tell him like no you're actually uh not royalty you're you're a popper you're you're a runt you're a well I, I think even without going that far and being like you're a pauper you're a runt just being like okay they are federation founding members but that doesn't make them completely like royalty in the federation it just makes them another member uh there is some great discussion in books like the last best hope by una mccormack that some Federation members do feel that those founding members have a lot more power than the rest in the Federation, uh, which should definitely be discussed. I don't know if... I don't think this show will discuss the intricacies of Federation politics and its member worlds, uh, but definitely mm. an interesting thing to um, convey to Jankum that just because you're a founding member doesn't mean you get everything handed to you. You do still have to do your work and be respected by everyone found i found the the exchange like funny but also uncomfortable because it Mm. just like it just felt like it 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 felt sometimes like uh i felt bad for jankum because he yeah he is of course being boastful and all those things but he's still a kid you know like so i just felt like dr gnome went a little too far and might have been a little too hard on him but uh, i would also say that like what was interesting is that he he does say like we reserve the name pog for runs or something like that so maybe in it, you know i think it's neat uh how tellarites have become kind of like very diverse mm. right now like we've seen very a lot of different types of tellarites throughout modern star trek and um so it's like well, even with neat old star trek with the fact that some of them have three fingers and some of them have five fingers oh that's right and that's a pretty and also, big yeah. diverse yes yeah. and some of them have hollow nightmare eyes and others have like actual eyes so it's like you know <laughs> like there's like yeah. all these there so they they do have a lot of interesting things uh, but yet we know very little about tellerite culture and tellerite society and stuff like that so i i think this is cool because it gives us a hint about not just tell our prime, but maybe the whole tell our system uh, comes into play, and maybe there's other worlds. And Jenkum's like kind of like similar how Remans are from another, you know, world in the Romulan system, you know. So I don't know. It, I, I'm excited about what this could lead to in terms of finding out more about Jenkum. Uh, and well, we'd and have to go to tell our prime to to learn any of that stuff, which they've none of the shows have never, ever taken never us done. There. And Father, you pointed out, which I uh, which I forgot, is that uh, Jenkum was on a sleeper ship, so he could have been, uh, like, out there for a hundred years or something like that. He might be from Archer's time wow. or something like that. I mean, you know? he, he, he doesn't know about the Federation. from pre-Archer. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I didn't he know about the Federation. Yeah. You know, the Tellarites were flying around with warp speed by the time that Archer was out on the Enterprise. Because you know they they ran into uh, some Tellarites in what season season two episode three I think when they had to go repair the Enterprise and the evil station tried to take over. But anyways, oh, like they had encountered like a Tellarite ship and the Tellarites were like, oh yeah, like there's a repair station. Like you know if you keep going down the road this way, like you'll see it. So they were a, a warp capable species. Uh, before the mid 22nd century, Jenkel must be older than that if he's on a mm. sleeper ship. 
And I believe could be from our, there's be been from some more. Century. Um, there's some more said in Enterprise with the relationship between the Andorians and the Talarites. And I believe the Andorians have been like, they've been hostile for X amount of time. Uh, so we know then at least mm. they've had warp capabilities for a little while before uh, Enterprise. Uh, so definitely sleeper ships going out. Um, I saw in our Discord server there was a little bit more discussion on just the fact of how many uh, beta quadrant, alpha quadrant species we've met already in Prodigy from uh, Ferengis to Tellarites to Brickars, all these species. Um, but I feel like the show has done a reasonably good job at explaining it. Um, but we did see a Kazon in this episode at the depot. Uh, not entirely explained in the show, but on Twitter, um, Aaron Waltke did go off and say that the Borg's transwarp corridors are used by other species now that the Borg have kind of been crippled by uh, Endgame and Voyager. Uh, which we see a bit of in Picard and obviously in Discovery. Uh, but that's a very interesting point to mm. talk about how far these species can now travel thanks to the crippled Borg faction. Um, hopefully they do somewhat explain that in the show. I don't think it's 100% needed. It's not needed for the story, but I would say it's needed for our peace of mind and just being able to be <laughs> like, okay, that that's why they're here. Okay, that, that explains it. I mean, I'm not even... I'm not even sure if it is needed because we know that where they are now, they're not mm. too terribly far from Tars Lamora from where yeah. they started. And we know Tars Lamora is not too terribly far from where Voyager made it out to before the end of season seven. Yeah. And, you know, we Neelix had like encountered, you know, fellow Talaxians in that part of space. So if other if other Talaxians have made it out that far, I don't I don't see why like maybe like some Kazon wouldn't. I mean, maybe it, you know, took and them twenty with years. Especially Kazon being or... nomadic um, yeah. species, it definitely does somewhat make sense. Um, but I think the show does somewhat of a good job of introducing these species. Obviously, this show is very much you know it's aimed for all the family, but it very much has a demographic tailored to a younger audience and it's introducing them to these species you know we've had the Borg mm -hmm. we've had the Kazon um, all these things Ferengi, having we did, to watch we did a whole Ferengi, yeah. Ferengi episode uh, yeah. so I think it's doing a good job and it doesn't need to explain why the Ferengi is there why a Kazon is that far towards the Beta Quadrant um, but the ancillary stuff for big nerds like us who are like ah oh, but it would take 40 years for a Kazon to get there <laughs> Um, we have people like Aaron Waltke being like, don't worry, we thought about that. It may not be said in the episode, yeah. but we have thought about that. Don't think we've just thrown it in haphazardly because we want to introduce the Frank, we want to introduce the Kazon. No, we, we thought about how we're going to do that, uh, which I just really appreciate from the people uh, who are making the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, just a quick uh, note from the chat, mm -hmm. uh, Chuck A, uh, who's one of our uh, members, says, uh, um, it, <laughs> tell a wrong. So I like that idea. I think we, if, if Chuck doesn't mind us uh, borrowing that, I think we should do a tell a right and tell a wrong sequence from now <laughs> On whenever we talk about the uh, the Tellarites and their behavior. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Noir you know, was tell also... wrong. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's interesting that they got like these these famous actors like Jason Alexander and mm. uh, Jamila Jamil, and you, like you cannot uh, you know recognize their their voices. Yeah, you can't. Uh, it's crazy. In the characters. Um, one thing that's very interesting about Doctor Noam, which I saw from uh, Yurik Hildebrand on Twitter, was in episodes where Doctor Noam has a helmet or a hood. His hair isn't is very like carved down, even when he's not wearing those things. Uh, but when he isn't wearing a helmet or a hood in an episode, his hair is very sticky out. Uh, <laughs> so obviously, when making the episode, they've just put that same model in, uh, right. which is just interesting. Uh, or That's he just funny. rapidly changes his hair when he knows that he doesn't <laughs> have to go in an EVA suit or a hood. <laughs> it's. It's interesting now that we've been talking about this too, that how they paired up the different 
uh, kids, the crew of the Protostar, basically, with the crew of the Dauntless kind of, like, showing us the counterpoint of each, maybe, in a weird way. Uh, uh, so that was interesting, because, like, Dal's the captain, so he met the captain, or, the, you know, the, mm. the, you know, like, things like that. So, uh, also, I mean, it makes sense, because, you know, Dal is the most, you know, like, like Janeway kind of hero, you know, he's been kind of, like, secretly, and not so secretly, now they're hugging and stuff. Uh, worshipping Janeway and like mm. looking up to her as a role model so that was like such a delightful moment uh, that that was probably um, I would rank that for me personally as one of the most delightful moments in all of Star Trek like top you know top tier moments like uh, I would I will remember that moment for many many years because it was just so cool how it was animated Dal's like you know reaction how he was starstruck like you know the the kind of like um you know the the things that they were saying to each other had like different meanings you know like mm. it was you know it was just such a beautiful scene and like Janeway super hyper focused and like kind of grumpy and like you know or cross because she's like on this hunt you know she needs to get to Chakotay it's just like in, in her mind every second that you know goes by could be a potential that Ch- she'll lose Chakotay you know that he'll die and yet for a moment she goes and she like uh, like pitches Starfleet to this kid who's like asking about who, that's what she thinks he's asking about you know and so she has like a moment where she gets to just kind of breathe and be you know like kind of optimistic you know about things or just even like you know it was just a cool moment it was a it, beautiful it was a very and nice realized moment yeah <laughs> speech between the two um there's two yeah. things i want to address uh one kind of off topic uh just uh kevin olaf pierce uh, in chat has said this multiple times uh, why do the new Enterprises don't have cloaking devices like the USS Defiant after Dominion War ended? Uh, because the Treaty of Algeron still exists, so they can't use yes. cloaking devices. Um, obviously, we'll have to talk uh, a little bit later about the Romulans in this episode, because they're the ones who uh, enforce, well, not enforce, but they're one of the signees of the Treaty of Algeron, uh, which is why the Federation can't use cloaking devices. Um, but going on topic... Um, Jill Although point seven. Section thirty one is using them. Yeah, also, but section thirty one. Section thirty one had one in lower decks. Like, yeah. does the Romulan free? Does it still apply with the Romulan free state? Uh, like no. in Picard, you could. I, oh, good. Okay, very, so well, you... we don't know, but I would say <laughs> oh, okay. no because it's not the Romulan Star Empire, and probably in the small print of the treaty, <laughs> it's this is between the Federation, United Federation planets, and the Romulan Star Empire not the Roman uh, free states. <laughs> free um, states, right. But going on topic, Jill47 says, let's talk about how suspicious Jamila's character is. Uh, she's going to be the Diviner's henchwoman if she's not already. <clears throat> uh, and yes, I think this is a very um, interesting thing to talk about because Ensign Essentia, the trill on the Dauntless, has very much been seen as n- caring for the Diviner, but also saying the right things at the right time from the, oh, we should use that uh, serum that was in his suit, that'll probably help, uh, to, oh, I'll say this specific key phrase, which is what the Diviner's phrase is. Um, there, there is no barrier we cannot overcome. What was that? Yeah. The phrase, yeah. yeah. And she's, she said, oh, there's no barrier we can overcome. Um, so I definitely think uh, she is very suspicious what that means because also why is a ensign who has bridge duties helping someone when like a nurse could be doing it for like his recuperation um right and so there's a lot she of also there. went straight to gwen like she knew she knew like she, like she recognized gwen basically you know when she that's was not like... the f- hardest one to like be like oh she's obviously evil because you know seen the diviner seen gwen Oh, they look similar. Right. They're same species. Uh, I haven't seen your species before. Um, I, but still, but that kind of seemed like to she, was, she yeah. was serving the diviner in, mm. like, you know, like, I'm I'm trying to help out your dad, so you need, you need to come with me. And I think that was very poorly handled from Essentia. Uh, and Essentia should be like, oh, this person doesn't want to... There's something about her father, but... We'll we'll see what happens. Uh, Starfleet boy, you were saying something. No, I was just wondering. I if I'm recalling correctly, but at the panel for Prodigy at New York, uh, didn't she say something about how like there's more 
than meets the eye with uh, her character or something like that. Maybe. I oh, didn't okay. actually watch that panel because I was... What did, did I watch that panel? Did, I think I was doing, like, behind-the-scenes stuff, so... I'll have to go back and... I'll report. Um, uh. <laughs> but I... It would be very interesting if Essentia is, like... Is a Vauna cut, which I've seen before, uh, theorized by some people. Because then it would very much link to... The reason why the Vaunacut civilization fell apart was because the Federation came in, did first contact. The Vaunacut believed that they were the only people in the universe. They met aliens. One side were like, yeah, let's go to the stars. And the other side was, no, let's be isolationist. And then a civil war happened, blew up their planet. What if... Essentia is a Vaunica in disguise who has infiltrated Starfleet and we, you know, we have evidence of other species and civilizations infiltrating Starfleet with Commodore O would currently be who hasn't in infiltrated right now. at this point uh, changelings, all, all these infiltrated <laughs> species Klingons um, yeah. Romulans <laughs> Elon, Elon Musk <laughs> um, but what would it mean yeah, then if somehow. the Vaunacut government actually knew that there were other species out there in the galaxy, but hid it from their own people, and were no. actually spying on these other people, on these uh, other civilizations, to be like, hmm, should should we tell our people that a federation exists? Uh, nah. Uh, so it's definitely kinda, interesting. I kind of like that. Yeah, that's a, a neat idea. And it would explain oh. a lot of Essentia uh, and her interactions with the Diviner. Being like, oh, you're a Vaunacut. And whether I don't think she, she would... And then it depends if she knows that the Diviner's from the future. Or she doesn't. And that's What something. if Essentia is future Gwen? I would not like that. <laughs> I don't think that would work well, because one, that's then steering Gwyn towards quite a bad end. Uh, and why would she go back in the past? And That's true. Or unless, unless she... I think it's just... I mean, I like, unless she's here to protect Gwyn somehow from something, or I don't well, know. Well, like, she did a pretty I've, bad I've job of I've encountered evil... I, I've crossed paths with evil versions of myself from the future that have come back in time. And I've had to, <laughs> I've had to deal with that, you know, multiple times. That's actually a thing in a, a, another popular science fiction franchise in Doctor Who. Mm. The the Doctor would uh, would turn evil in the future and then come back in time. Oh, the Valyard that hasn't happened yet, or it won't um, happen. But that's that's Doctor Who. <laughs> Doctor Who stuff. I do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, but I think in X Men comics there wasn't someone evil in the future and then came back in you're time. Talking about X Men, yeah, I, think that, that I happened. don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. There's a lot no, of timey wiminess in X Men. Wild. Um, yeah, but is is there anything else in this episode that you want to talk about? Um, New Murph. Oh yeah. yes, New Murph. <laughs> okay, first thoughts. Uh, five words or less what did you think of murph favri well i'm gonna steal your thing so i'm not gonna say it <laughs> i don't know why i said five words but five words <laughs> oh wait less uh, than five words i thought you said <laughs> five words or less okay okay not as cute we'll see Ooh. <laughs> question mark at the end. yeah question mark isn't a word so you're fine with that um starfleet boy five words or less what do you think of all murph? right i'm I'm going to steal a thing that I heard you say, which is Leggy Murph. <laughs> um, uh. <laughs> also, anybody in chat who has thoughts on Murph, uh, give us your own five words or less of your first thoughts on Murph, your thoughts now on Murph. Just Murph thoughts <laughs> of this new form. Um, I'm I think... officially going to change Monday to Murph Day. Morph... <laughs> Murph Day, Mur not Morph. Murph, Murph Day. Day. <laughs> um, I think... Ooh, Murph haikus. That'd be interesting. I don't really want to <laughs> come up with a haiku on the spot because that'll take too much time and won't be fun for any of us. 
Um, I feel I like an internet words. sensation from I Quit Star Trek could do that. Yes. <laughs> Olivia might do yes. Murph I'll, haikus I'll ask really well. Olivia to come up with a Murph haiku. Um, <laughs> we have Stress Free K saying seems like an adolescent Murph. Uh, so yeah, very toddler like. Um, that's five words. Uh, Joanne Robertson, hope not the final form. Uh, some very <laughs> five words. Uh, Jill forty seven, too small to eat construct. <laughs> very nice. Uh, He's well, that's how they're gonna get rid of it eventually. W- wait for Murph to get big enough. He can yeah. he can devour it. He can devour it. Um, um, I just love the idea of Murph being like Frieza from Dragon Ball Z and just being this like, isn't this isn't final. even my final form. Yeah, <laughs> Murph, um, uh, Murph. So Murph, I was kind of like shocked to see him, but now that I've seen him a couple of times, he's got a cuteness to him. You know, he's like still yes. like got something about him. Uh, I'm curious what the floaty thing is on top of his head. Like yes, that's definitely. like a, an interesting thing. And then Fathery speculated something cool on his show about like how maybe uh, slime worms um, uh, t- take on characteristics of whatever they're around. And so now uh, Murph's transformation is influenced by these bipedal mm-hmm. uh, folks around him. I but I also fun. like. Yeah. My friend's uh, daughter remarked when she saw Murph and saw that he had legs, uh, she said, oh, it's like when I stopped crawling. And I thought that was cool. And I think that is actually the intention. Oh, that's actually kind of have... cute. Um... <laughs> it's, it's like to have something for people, uh, people, <laughs> young people, small people, <laughs> children <laughs> to relate to, uh, you know, in a sense. And, and it's true because Murph's kind of transforming as humans do as they age. So... Uh, yeah, maybe they'll use them to kind of like illustrate those kinds of things to kids. So then, was Murph going in a cocoon, kind of like when babies are like teething? Yeah, or Just something like that. In I pain like that. Yeah, and changing. Oh yes, and then you do have fevers when you're teething. That's true. That's a yeah. good point. Like that's true. It's also kind of a <laughs> uh, kind of a puberty mm. allegory, a very like safe way for uh, for children to to see. That we change. Uh, I guess, yeah, that yeah, whole that's idea. How my body changes. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I, I definitely. The thing is, so you could actually see this form in the New York Comic Con trailer for uh mm-hmm. this mid-season premiere. Uh, it also uh accidentally, well, quote unquote, accidentally, uh, leaked in SFX magazine. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, so they didn't do the best job of keeping it hidden. Um, but it got I'm... past me. But I saw that after it, I was like, "Oi!" Yeah. Um, and then they did a live stream before this episode happened, or like a twenty-four hour live stream, and they revealed Murph at the end. I believe I didn't watch the live stream because I was like, "I know what this turns into," um, but. In terms of my thoughts on Leggy Murph, <laughs> I feel like its proportions are just a little bit off, that it feels weird. Uh, I just hope that Murph... It, it'll make or break it, depending on how Murph speaks, because Murph will have inevitably speak, and how Murph speaks will either make it cute or a uh, monstrosity. <laughs> I have trust in D. Bradley Baker because he's a great voice actor. Um, yeah. But I guess we'll see, you know, how much was him influencing it? How much was the writers being like, oh, we want Murph to talk like someone from New York? Who knows? Um, <laughs> That'd actually be funny if he does talk like someone from New York. That'd be wild. Yeah. Uh, or, no, but... or if he has, like a, he has like a Cockney accent. Oh, no. I have, <laughs> I have a lot of confidence that... Uh, oh, me, Murph's... Governor. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of co- confidence that Murph, because uh, th- it seems like there's so much attention on Murph, so I have a lot of confidence that they're really thinking hard about Murph, and it'll mm. be something, something like really well thought out. It could still fail, but I think they're they're gonna think about it a lot. Um, um, I don't think it's gonna fail though, personally. I, I like I said, uh, you know, it was yeah, a little we'll startling at first. Yeah, like it was a little startling at first to see this Murph. Uh, I'm getting ex- excited to. 
to I, I like the idea that there's this character that will transform. Maybe Murph will become this like crazy monster beast thing or whatever, you know, I don't know, it'll be mm. nuts. <laughs> so I see some uh question well, some things in the chat which I do want to uh comment on. Uh someone has a theory on how to contact Janeway without the ship. Uh they say use Ooh. a shuttlecraft. Uh any shuttlecraft that the protostar makes is probably we'll going to be corrupted. Yeah. Uh so that probably can't be done um but one i do see from aldrich uh seven a nine i hope i pronounce your name uh correctly uh the show started in delta quadrant jumped to gamma quadrant back to delta quadrant somehow federation space near romulan neutral zone uh without going through romulan territory uh i do want to comment on that uh the show did start in the delta quadrant but tars lamora is on the delta quadrant beta quadrant border uh, which is why the Diviner had most of his undesirables, his slave labor, uh, Beta Quadrant species, because he hates the Federation and was specifically targeting Beta Quadrant species. Uh, they never went to the Gamma Quadrant, they just went in the direction of the Gamma Quadrant, uh, which is Galactic West. Um, <laughs> That's to... right. No, yeah, West. Wait, is it? Yeah, because from yeah. Delta Quadrants up here, oh, Gamma yeah, Quadrants yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So they were heading yeah, in yeah. that direction. Um, and then, in regards to they're near the Romulan neutral zone in the Beta Quadrant without going through Romulan territory, the neutral zone, like, completely covers uh, Romulan space. Romulan space has kind of been enveloped by Federation space, um, according to the maps they've used in Picard and other places. Uh, so they could just be coming south ways to the uh, Romulan neutral zone yeah. uh, instead of north ways. Yeah, it actually makes a... It, it, it makes sense if you look at it on a star chart. Um, when we had Aaron Welke on Text Trek uh, a week ago, he told us the, the oh. that area of space where, yeah, there there's part of the Federation that does kind of like wrap around on the north side of the Romulan Star Empire, right where the Beta Quadrant and Delta Quadrant meet. So, mm. um, uh, so it definitely does make sense there. Uh, and I saw some people talking of, you know, why could the Romulan D. Derodexes, uh kind of go through the neutral zone to talk to the Dauntless? Uh, but we, we've seen that before in The Next Generation. They've been like, why are you in, coming like, to the neutral every, zone? Every Star Trek show, yeah. Every every Star Trek show where they go to the neutral zone, we see like yeah. a D. Derodex D. Cloak in front of the show. So I presume somewhat in the neutral zone stipulation it's like if a federation ship comes close you're allowed to cross into the neutral zone <laughs> who knows they they just do it so it makes more sense um Drama. and chill 47 <laughs> we could really use an official map of their travels hopefully when if we get like some sort of ancillary uh prodigy book we could get that um but yeah considering ev everyone go by using, yeah Go. Everyone go buy Aaron Harvey and Rich Shepis's Star Trek the Animated Series book oh. and then say, like, oh, they should do one of these for Lower Decks and they should do one of oh, these for Prodigy. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That we'll wasn't more. where I we'll thought you were books. going to go. I thought you were going to go to... Um, who's the person who put out the stellar cartography book? Larry Nemechek. Larry Nemechek. Uh, because well, yeah, it seems like the shows are Jeff using Mandel's... that map. Yeah. I can go grab that, I guess. <laughs> I don't know how we can show it, but uh, maybe I, I maybe next week fine. I'll have yeah maybe yeah, next, next week. week. I'll go yeah. I'll go find a good a good one to use, and then I'll show y'all next week if if we stream Sunday. I'll have yeah. I'll have something prepared. Definitely. Um, and Stress Free K asks, uh, have we all agreed that Gwen's father has been faking it all along? I think that's in terms of the memory issues. I don't mm. think so because I think yeah, it's I still think just so. side effects from Medusin. Uh, madness. Um, I think they're resistant to it more than because I I guess the madness wears off because it wore off of Gwen. Well, I would I, more say yeah. probably the Federation has methods to oh help. right to reverse it right or at least like yeah and you're right, maybe not even point. knowing that it was caused by Medusa and just being like okay this person is in mental distress we have a procedure for that and then just do yeah it makes sense. That. Um, Which is what Zero was trying to do. You're right. Uh, a couple episodes yes, ago, he was definitely. trying to get get her to a better facility so that he could treat her. So yeah, that makes uh, complete sense. And the, yeah. I guess the only the only other thing I want to say is that like 
the episode was so well paced and action packed. It was just like boom, 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 you know, with like really good exposition and dialogue. I just this episode was just like top of the charts for me. I thought it was really great. Yeah, yeah. It, it flowed great, didn't it? Yeah. Like, yes. It, it just like there is never like a lull or a, a dull moment. Yeah, definitely. I um, mean, yeah, we had some action. We had some great, you know, uh, speeches uh, between Janeway and Dal. Uh, some good interactions, some good aliens, some good shots. Uh, and now our protostar crew are heading into the neutral zone with remodulated shielding so they don't look like a Federation ship. Because, yeah, I presume that other, you know, like traders and freighters and those people, they can come and go from the neutral zone reasonably okay. Uh, who they'll meet in the neutral zone or you know, will they be chased by Romulans? Will we see some Remans? That would be cool. Um, will Ooh, we the get Remans. some stuff with... <laughs> oh, there's the USS Verity over there with Admiral Picard. <laughs> yes, I hope we'll so. See. That would be really cool. <laughs> um, but I think... Oh, we are going to meet another Admiral this hmm. season, though, so that'll be yes, cool. Yes, we, ha- we do have yeah. Jellico coming, coming sometime yeah. soon. Yeah. Uh, who knows when. Uh, but I think, you know, we've talked a lot about Prodigy. There has been some other news this week, which we'll uh, touch on. We are nearly hitting the one hour mark, but we will touch on this news as it's pretty big. Uh, but the official uh, Star Trek convention, Star Trek Mission Seattle, this time, um, has been cancelled. Um, Favri, as a uh, congoer to... You went to Chicago and you've been going to Vegas, Yes. Yeah, I've, um, I've done what Vegas are your several times. On this news that it's been cancelled. Um, I mean, it's sad. I like the idea of there being a roaming convention. I think that would be good for, you know, a lot of people who n- normally wouldn't be able to go to a Star Trek con unless it was like mm. in their part of the country. So at least for people in the United States, it was a, seemed like a good idea. Uh, it's sad that it seems like they're no longer uh doing that or at least you know they're skipping next year but i I, there's you know no talk on them like resuming star trek conventions after that uh so yeah that that sucks Uh, however i'm i'm very used to like the way like creation does cons and how they do vegas and i uh have never been to a read pop con before i went to Chicago there were like some things I didn't like about Chicago and it felt it felt a bit small I think maybe they were hoping for a larger turnout because the uh, venue that they chose was huge it's like one of the largest convention centers in the world I'm sure mm. it's gigantic so I don't know if, if they decided you know Star Trek is, is too small that we're not like we're not gonna have like a big enough turnout that you know it's, it's worth it or I don't know if it was something you know Paramount is has canceled you know the destination con yeah. so I don't know if it was like they, they were the ones we pulled the plug on it, but yeah, it's definitely unfortunate. However, I am still, uh, I'm, I'm doing the Star Trek cruise next year and I'm doing a Vegas next year. And, uh, you know, I, I think those are two great events. So I still have plenty of stuff to look forward to, but it does suck for the people who were only going to do Seattle and now they're mm. not able to, to do any, any of the other events. Yeah, definitely. Um, Starfleet boy, you know, where are you going to go to Seattle? Are you bummed out from this news? I'm super bummed personally because uh, I used to live in Seattle, so I was uh, double excited to go and return to Seattle and visit friends and uh, you know uh, uh, folks that I that I know over there. But also to celebrate uh, you know Star Trek in in the city that I love. But also I went to Mission Chicago and I felt like you know I felt like I was the first. It was my first. Well, it was my first like Star Trek only convention, mm. uh, and so I felt like it was a cool tradition to keep going with. So I'm kind of sad that it's interrupted. I'm maybe they'll pick them up or whatever, and and who knows? But yeah, I was really looking forward to like seeing some of the same folks that uh, were there, and also new folks, folks that I know in Seattle that were gonna go. I was hoping to meet you and Jack and yes. like the team at Trek Central. You guys were supposed to come out, so. Uh, that being said, I did check out the Vegas stuff and it looks pretty exciting. So I'm going to try to go. Uh, I'm looking into uh, doing that. It's a little later, so I think I can swing it. Um, uh, and I like the idea that uh, Father proposed of like a venue where if you chose to, it's all everything's there. Your hotel is in the same mm. location as the uh, convention. So yes, uh, and we're yeah. going to be back at the Rio. Thank <laughs> God. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that was yeah, really that, good that's about the, best the part of... destination 
one in Birmingham when they had it in Birmingham because right. everything was at the NEC from people's uh, hotels to the convention. Whereas with the London one, it was very you go to the convention and then you go to your hotel. And I really do like those integrated convention stars. You know, yeah. they do have their place. Yeah. Um, so yeah. That's what I love about uh, both the Vegas and the cruise, actually, because on the cruise, you know, everyone's stuck on the ship together. Mm. But the, the cool thing about Vegas is that, you know, the Rio is small enough that, you know, when the truckies are there, they kind of like take over that whole <laughs> hotel. So like mm. you just go to any any hotel bar and there's just going to be like so many people there like in Starfleet uniforms. If you're you're someone with like any type of online activity in the, in the Trek community, you're probably going to see people, you know, from online. So you're mm. going to see, you know, uh, people that you you're meeting for the first time, but you're going to find, you know, Oh, I have so much in common with this fellow Trek fan. I can just, you know, sit here and talk about Cardassian neck ridges or, you know, whatever random star Trek topic y you, you all have like that proximity. Uh, you, so you're just forced to kind of um, bump into people. And I, I think that's very delightful. And I, it's why I love going to Vegas and doing the cruise too, both, I guess. The other yeah. thing is a, a convention, like a Star Trek, you know, convention is like such a great place. Like a, I feel like a safe place to just like fully let your Star Trek ness fly, you know, like you can cosplay, you can talk about the most minutia uh, thing like how uh you know like <laughs> you know, the physics of star star trek there's so many great <laughs> fan panels and stuff like that and so mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a shame that you know the official license is not you know doing something with it so uh you know i i think that's like a nice touch and they you know i was hoping to get a murph <laughs> like, <I> was... <laughs> well who knows they may like... bring out a new murph <laughs> plush of leggy murph yeah exactly um, i was hoping to get like there's exclusive like i have my Jordy bear and stuff like that so yeah. you never no, know this is what it'll be <laughs> so hell is when uh when eagle moss comes back in their new form now I, I hear they got like new owners now, so that that's actually you know a uh, very possible thing on the horizon. That, but possibly, I know they brought people in for the administration stuff. Um, so, yeah, so yeah. It, it it might happen, mm. uh, but th they'll have a they'll have a subscription where like oh this month you get like the the Murph left arm, and then this next month you get like the head, and then here you get like the right foot, and you'll have to like build <laughs> build your own Murph. That yeah. way. And with <laughs> the uh, cool. the first uh, version of that subscription service, they give you some sewing kit. So you can sew oh my gosh, together. I would love it if Build a Murph <laughs> replaced or was uh, was a competition for Build a Bear. That would be amazing. <laughs> like... Well, they could just they could ju they could just have a Murph available at the Build a Bear, <laughs> so we wouldn't have to put them yeah. out of business. To... <laughs> The other, the other thing is is that like uh, what Father was saying about like how uh, a roving convention is exciting because not only for folks to uh, to see the convention who normally can't but also to kind of explore places you might not have gone you know before if mm -hmm. you are uh, if you're just like excited to go to conventions so I like that idea oh. too because uh, you know I think Father you've never been to Seattle so that would have been your first time in Seattle like so yeah it's it's a it's a cool yeah, idea but I, hope, I hope they keep going when with I it. when I go to cons I'm there for the cons so I don't <laughs> um... like like when we were in Chicago I never like I never did, I, well we went out and ate pizza one night but like I didn't I didn't really like try to like go do Chicago things you know it's like I, I'm <laughs> here when, for Star when Trek when I go to conventions like, yeah, I... and they're in like new places that I haven't been before I do go to the city like I went to Gamescom for the first time this year and I just went around Cologne, um, so yeah, oh, that, that's really oh, my place. Yeah, um, but yeah, so you know, it's sad that they're not going forward with the official um, mission Seattle for this year. We might hear new stuff for next year, maybe a year after. Um, who knows? But you know, we'll see what the future has in store for Star Trek conventions. Uh, whether we'll see any in the UK, uh, obviously with yeah. Destination uh, not doing great, but you know we'll we'll see what this means for but the you future. Have, uh, you have FedCon in Germany, yeah. Which if you can if you can get over to Germany, unofficial, but I I've it's never been. But it's basically the so biggest Star Trek. Trek. Yeah, uh, it's it's like it's like the STLV of of Europe. Yeah, um, but it does do you know all the other sci-fi stuff. Uh, from right, Wars, yeah, it has Star, Star Trek, Trek and other things. But they um, always get a ton. I like I always look, and it's like a ton of Star Trek guests there. It's like yeah. half Star Trek and then half, you know, like Star Wars, Stargate, 
other other things, but yeah, the it's always Germans just do a, like a bunch Star of Trek, Trek people. Um, but yeah, I think and that's, David Hasselhoff. <laughs> uh, but I think that's a good place to end. Uh, oh, can stream? I just give one little news oh. tidbit? Tib- yes. Go Sorry, to yeah. Trek Central's t- okay. go to Trek Central's Twitter stream and check out the uh, repost of Terry Metalis's little peek at another new. We got a new little peek at the soundtrack uh, for Picard. So there's like a a cool little video in in the studio with the uh, with with some of the a little tiny bit of the soundtrack playing. So uh, yes. check that out, and it's it's on Trek Central already. So go check it out and there, or you can <laughs> let me check out because I think the. Uh... Trek Central 100k um, subscriber giveaway uh, on our website is nearing its end. I think it's only got a couple of hours if my website actually loads, Um, (laughs) which it isn't, but uh, let me just check quickly. Um, 100. There it is. Uh, Scroll down. Loading. It has 114 minutes left. Ooh, so go. Um, <laughs> if there is anybody who has not uh, put in um, their tickets for our 100k subscriber giveaway, where we're giving away a giant uh, ba- uh, badge, um, what they called stamp stamps, oh, a giant yeah, yeah. stamp of John Luke. There is a fantastic uh, model of I think it's the USS Majestic, <laughs> um, a Miranda class. From JJM Model Making uh, and a bunch of other cool stuff which we're giving away. Uh, so if you haven't, go and uh, put in your name for that. Uh, obviously, none of us have put in our name for that because that would be unprofessional of us. And you know, it's for it's for the fans. It's for all of you who have put us uh, and taken us to a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. So we thank you very much. Um, for that and that's our thank you to you Uh, if you want to follow us on other places uh, we are on Twitter at the Trek Central for however long Twitter is up Uh, we're on Facebook Instagram uh, I Uh, think TikTok we we have a TikTok I think we're on Mastodon (laughs) now uh, because a lot of people Mm -hmm. are moving to Mastodon Um, and probably some other places (laughs) maybe we're on MySpace I don't know um, we're on Google Plus. We're on all these. Weird Wait, does MySpace not... still exist? I is have that no what idea. <laughs> um, I hope but... not. I hope my MySpace page isn't out there somewhere. <laughs> I, think, I think it's still, still exists. I see there. there. Yeah, I gotta um, look it up now. <laughs> but, um, very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this live stream talking about Prodigy episode fourteen, Crossroads. Um, and we're definitely looking forward to the rest of Prodigy with next week. I believe the episode is called Masquerades. So it'll definitely be interesting now that the protostar mm-hmm. is in the neutral zone. Uh, and we'll go from there and see what the rest of season one has in store for our crew, including the new leggy Murph. Uh, but <laughs> as always, uh, I have to thank my wonderful co-hosts for joining me today. Uh, so thank you, Fari. Thank you, Starfleet Boy. Uh, make Thank sure you, to Dom. go uh, to their own channels, uh, youtube.com slash uh, starfleetboy and Starfleet youtube.com Boy slash and text. Trek, uh where text they also do, uh, yes, uh, where they also do uh, discussions yeah. on Star Trek with the latest episodes and other things. Um, Starfleet Boy, I believe you're going through, is it the animated series right now? Yes, so mm-hmm. Saturdays yes. at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern, we do the animated series. So we just covered uh, Once Upon a Planet, which is the sequel to uh, the TO leave. episode. Shore leave. Sure. Yeah, so, yeah, so go check that out. Um, and then... And I think uh, Mud's Passion is, is, is coming next, up next, yeah, right? Yeah, the next one, yeah. Uh, so. Yes, that episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes. the saturday well, morning all cartoon those, by the way. <laughs> about yeah. date rape drugs oh jeez. yes the animated series Much was passion. definitely an interesting one um but i guess with that weird notes to end off on we are ending uh this stream uh thank you again for joining us uh both my co-hosts and the chat and as always we'll actually do the official one this time but live long and prosper.
Let me know.